I am here with my dear friend, Richard. Hello, Richard. <laughs> Andy, as always, great to be here. Uh, so you are a doctor. Let's just quickly touch on that. So your day-to-day, you've seen patients as sort of first, first point of call for something medical. Absolutely. And in fact, in my practice, I used to have a list of patients that, that deal with my list. But these days, they get me just to do the on-calls. So in a sense, I'm seeing the sort of emergency end of general practice, which has been great. Awesome. Um, so that is that is what you're doing today, which is why you're very well versed to talk about all sorts of things. We have covered the Olympics. We've covered the Paralympics uh, and discovered that they want to be called Olympians, uh, not Olympiads, not um, Paralympiads. Yes, yeah, so they see themselves as athletes primarily, which was absolutely that, that was in a sense, you might say it's obvious. But actually, people are not not defining themselves by disability, what they can't do, but by what they can do. And of course, number one is Christians. It did strike me, though. It was such an obvious, well, yes, they're athletes. So why do we say they're paralysed athletes as opposed to athletes? And afterwards, I was reflecting, thinking, this is such an obvious thing, but we love to use descriptions so we know what we want to describe somebody as. And you know, isn't it interesting that, G- that Jesus used to think, obviously, outside the box, outside our box, that is, and we box people in. And um, and I think one of the things I've learned as a Christian that increasingly over the years is, is to try and expand my imagination, try to see people and things as God does. Now, of course, we don't get it completely right because we're not God and he is. Um, but when you see how Jesus sees things, and I, and I love The Chosen. If you, you listeners get a chance, watch The Chosen on television, which uh, is a picture of, of the disciples and how they're trying to sort of react to Jesus, expanding their lives and getting them to think outside the box and think as God does. And and when we do, wow, it's very liberating. It really is. But we just we just desperately want to put people in a box so we can, I guess, compare them or compare ourselves or something. Yeah, you're right, absolutely. And uh, and of course, one of the, one of the great stories in the Bible is how um, Samuel, the prophet Samuel, was trying to pick um, the next king after Saul, and you know, he said he said to Jesse, "Show me all your sons." Oh, the first one looks great. He's handsome. He's tall. You know, he's powerful. And God says, no, he's not the one. And eventually he picks David, the young shepherd boy, the least of the least, in, the, in a sense. God looks at the heart. And you know, it's about getting our hearts in tune with God. Because, mm. uh, of course, he was basically the run to the family. He was the smallest yeah. and the weakest. Yeah, ab- absolutely. But he was strong enough to beat Goliath because it wasn't him winning. It was God. Amen. Right. Uh, what have you got for us this week then, Richard? So um, having spent the last two weeks looking at, as you said, looking at the, uh, the faith of Olympians and, and Paralympians, um, I came across an article, which I'll just lead into in a second. But going back to these last two weeks, you know, I'm sure your listeners, uh, as we were, Andy, I'm, I'm just amazed by some of the stories, uh, not least in terms of the Paralympians with all the challenges they have giving glory to God, you know, and how God was completely central to their lives. But one thing that struck me is, of course, it's a very odd business being an Olympic athlete. You know, the Olympics and Paralympics happen every four years. So you have this sort of See the quiet period, valley, and you build up to this massive mountain peak. And then, you know, they've just finished the Paralympics, the Olympics, and now they're back down into the valley. Um, and I read about Sarah Story, who's our most famous Paralympian cyclist. She's got, I don't know, 19 medals, <laughs> and she's in her 40s already. Well, she's now looking forward to 2028. She'll almost be 50 by the time 2028 comes. But her whole life is, is you know, is directed by four-year cycles because athletes are always looking ahead but some of them many of them come right down and they have a real sort of depressive low after these big peaks you know faith helps of course and um, one thing is that the, 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 the these um topics teach us with the uh, christian olympians christian paralympians is that you know they're not their lives their success their self-value isn't determined by whether they get gold silver or bronze it's because, you know, it's not what they achieve, it's what God's achieved already in their lives. And, and that's marvellous. You know, they know that they're loved regardless. But I thought, well, how does it relate to us? You know, it's all very well, but these this is the cream of the crop. You know, normal, mundane, Joe average person or Joan average um, lady. Um, and then I come across this article, which rather links in nicely, called The Significance of Now. The Significance of Now. Why is now important? And what the article was saying is this, and I think it's quite important for us, really. Do we simply look ahead to a more glorious time in our lives? Is the grass always greener ahead? For other people, some people look back. Ah, things were so much better in the past. 
or do we fully embrace the present? Of course, this looks up, you know, Olympians, oh, boy, here's time. I've got a chance to stand on the podium again. Or, well, I wasn't so good this time. I was better four years ago. Looking in the past, looking, looking in the future. And I've got a few, just a few sort of um, just general stories to link in with this. Imagine, for example, you're a, a newly retired woman. And, and here's, this is a true story. You used to work in publishing. Now you're retired. There's no work deadlines. You're just a little bit bored, a little bit flat. You know, life's OK. Uh, you're not living in Gaza. You're not living in Ukraine. Um, you're volunteering for your church. You're seeing your family. You're reading, but you're, you're feeling unneeded and it hurts. So that's one scenario. Here's another one. Imagine your new parents who, before you had kids, used to go climbing, read the Bible together and sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Three months after welcoming baby Grace into your lives, life's a bit different. You know, not least sleep. Some life chapters seem to be more exciting than others, a bit like in the Olympics. And sometimes we choose them, and quite often we don't. And the danger is either we look back with rose-tinted glasses, our life was easier, life was better then, or perhaps we look forwards. Oh, I wonder what, you know, it's just a bit boring at the moment. Hopefully there's something better ahead, a golden future. You know, maybe in the future, you know, there's God's got a better plan for me. There's going to be a, you know, I'm going to be more fruitful. I'm going to get a job working in a Christian organization. Here's Andy running a Christian radio station. You know, maybe I could do something like that. Or maybe I'm going to find the right partner. Finally, God's going to give me the right spouse, which would be wonderful. Or maybe I'll move to the countryside. You know, life's a bit dull at the moment, but it's going to be better in the future. And what this article was saying is the significance of now. And the, the, the person who wrote it quoted a, a famous American writer, Christian writer called Dallas, Dallas Willard who wrote a book called The Divine Conspiracy, which I've meant to read, Andy, for years and haven't. So there we go. This has given me another prod. Famous writer, Dallas Willard, The Divine Conspiracy. And he said this, just, just one paragraph. We must accept the circumstances we find ourselves in as the place of God's kingdom and blessing. God has yet to bless anyone except where they actually are. If we faithlessly, faithlessly discard situation after situation, moment after moment as not being right, we will have no place and we will be in no place to receive his kingdom into our life. For those situations and moments are our life. It's all about now. So the writer was saying, hey, listen, I'm not being a judgmental. You know, we all get these thoughts. Oh, life was a bit easier 10 years ago. Oh, and here am I thinking about retirement soon. Oh, it's going to get easier when the R word, the retirement word kicks in. You know, we do. And sometimes our imagination can be a little bit unhelpful. We can think a bit like the disciples did unhelpfully and, and get stuff wrong. Yes, maybe life, if you've got young children, is too busy to spend 30 minutes reading the Bible every morning. You know, we get that. Maybe you can't with young kids go to church every single week, for example, for whatever reason. Maybe you're living in a retirement home. You can't do what you used to do. But here's the question. Are we beyond God's blessing? And this is what Andy's going to pick up on, I'm sure, today. Is God so limited to situations where everything is just right? And he comes across this lovely phrase, the Goldilocks zones. <laughs> You know, in Goldilocks, she turns up, doesn't she? And the oh, oh, that porridge is too hot. This porridge is too cold. Oh, look, this porridge is just right. This bed's too hard. This bed's too soft. Oh, look, this bed's just right. The Goldilocks zones where everything is just right. Is God limited to that? Doesn't Jesus know your situation and mine? And of course, he mentions Queen Esther in the Bible. You know, the king picked her just as another royal plaything. God used her as his people's liberator. Or the Roman slaves in Bible times who became Christians and pointed others in tough situations to Jesus through their conduct and character. You know, neither of them chose their situation. Okay, Esther had a posh, posh life. The slaves certainly didn't, but neither of them chose their position. You know, where am I going with this? Well, at every stage in life, um, people, there are people to connect with. There are ways to rely on God and virtues to develop. And I've got three questions for our listeners today, which I've, I've stolen from this article, but I'm going to pass them on because I think it'll get people thinking. Three questions for every stage in life, whether you're an empty nester, you're older and your kids have left home, or you're in a medically forced retirement, whatever. 
here's the first question who am i <laughs> always a good question to ask who am i this is especially important when you're moving from one life chapter to another um, you might be in a good time you may just have got married for example or it might be painful you've got a chronic illness you can't work you've been bereaved you know I, I meet so many patients sadly who come to see me in a terrible state their spouse of 50 years has just died now that's really quite common in my in my job you know it's, that's really hard i mean i've been married 36 years andy um coming up 30 perhaps and maybe a bit less i don't know but you know can you imagine living that long or even longer with your partner and then suddenly you know he or she's passed but as christians we have advantages we stand on solid ground our identity is as children of god as citizens of his kingdom now i'm not saying whatever your situation just get over it it's just that whatever our situation good or less good um, our identity as children of god makes it possible to explore who we are and should spark our imagination as to what's possible now whether i'm about to pick up the kids from school now this i read in the article do you know one of the great greatest things probably we did looking back over our lives heather and me we came back we'd been working in africa as missionaries came back in our mid-30s young kids and heather particularly because i was working in a and e accident emergency at that stage would pick up our kids from school and I, and she would chat to the other young mums in the in the school ground because you've got you know 10 minutes 15 minutes while you wait for your kids to come out she'd invite them to alpha we did alpha in our house with mums from the school gates i'd never seen them before till they came on alpha you know and one or two became christians that's using you might think a situation it's not as flash as being a missionary abroad she wasn't working as a doctor much she was doing a little bit but not much but at the school gates you know mundane position yeah, god can work yeah. whatever your situation is imagine you're flying an aeroplane very nice we've got uh, good friends whose son relatively recently qualified as a pilot um you know you can you can talk to people how you treat the staff don't be all high and mighty treat all the people all the you know all the, all the serving crew um the very best you can land the plane <laughs> the best you can always good. imagine <laughs> yeah, imagine you're a barista you know making the best make the best coffee and chat to people with a smile on your face don't just do it you know sullenly and who knows what conversations can, can crop up you never know because god will bless where you are now a, a national trust volunteer i wrote in you know you're doing your best to to make the best gardens possible you know god's given you this gift he's also given you the garden do your best and and look at the pleasure and then maybe you can point people to the creator who made the gardens so number one whatever stage in life who am i what what are my gifts who am i number two what should i do what is my purpose as we said earlier sometimes we get to choose um we you know but sometimes we have to deal with the cards that were dealt with uh, i remember reading about a couple who were just planning their retirement you know they got a bucket list anybody know about bucket lists you know andy's much too young but but yeah there's the things on a bucket list i'd you know i'd like to do um, Heather, for example, is taking us abroad to a hot country next month because one of her things is she wants to uh, have a few nights sleeping in a desert. Okay, well we'll go to we'll go to a hot country and do that. We'll go to Oman and do that. So there you go. It's on our bucket list. But this couple had had a bucket list prepared, and there's much foreign travel. And then tragedy struck when the woman's sister developed terminal cancer, and they had to change tack. They had to support her and her kids in her final few months. And of course they had many questions for god god this wasn't our plan but in their grief and in their questioning god gave them something really important to do and they responded in a sense it was not what they asked for but it was god's plan for their lives they had a new purpose and so when we're thinking about responding to god in each chapter of our life um the article is saying consider the word vocation and uh, just a little bit of, uh, of latin vocation comes from vocari which means to call as a christian we are called we have a calling from god that's our vocation and it there's a vocation by the way throughout every part of our lives this is a little bit of teaching for me here you might think oh, at 21 what's your vacation you know i became a doctor that's my vocation or maybe it's to become a pastor or maybe something else a teacher no 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 vocation is not just about your job vocation is about your life we all have a vocation from god god and it can change um through our lives depending on what um our situation is 1 corinthians chapter 7 paul says any situation we find ourselves in is a calling from god that means right here 
right now. He has specific things for us to do. And in the middle of this, he calls us to develop the characteristics of Jesus. Maybe we're tired sorting out our kids. I've just been just come back from my grandchildren. They're tiring, <laughs> um, especially not least for the parents. You know, I only see them once a week. The parents are very tiring. Mm. But maybe we're tired sorting out our kids or we're caring from an elderly relative. How, how many of us have got elderly relatives? God is teaching us patience and gentleness. Now is significant in our lives and in other people's lives. So number one, who am I? Number two, what is my purpose? What should I do? Number three, and this is the, the one really I want to get people to focus on. Who am I connecting with at this stage of my life? Who am I connecting with? You know, when we move from one life to another, we will lose relationships. When I leave work, Heather, my, actually my wife has just announced she's retiring uh, at Christmas. Um, I'm going to go on a bit into 2025, but she will lose um, colleagues who are friends. If your kids move from primary school to secondary school, yeah, there'll be a change in parents. You'll gain some, you'll lose others. You can't keep all your relationships alive. But there will be some that, that you, you sense from God, this one needs to endure. I want to deepen it. I want to strengthen it. Take these friends to coffee. Take them to a rugby match. Take them to dinner. Take them to a flower show. Whatever whatever you know, really uh, turns you on in a sense. Invest in friendships. Who am I connecting with at this stage? God will bring new people into your lives. Um, I'm, and there's a lovely story about a university student. So a university, short, you know, three-year cycle, invited many people to church, and about 30 people, 30 other students came because this university student um, invited them. Now, he is now working, and, of course, the other students are working. And he, he said, I won't see many of these people ever again, but I hope I've played a role in their lives. And that's what we can do. You know, his role isn't the, the result. His role is to invite them. And that's what he did to share faith. And here's the question for all our listeners, for Andy and for me. What role are you playing in this stretch of life's journey in helping others see Jesus? How are you helping people come to Jesus? Who are you connecting with at this stage? Now, the guy who had written this article just turned 40. They're a bit younger than Andy, a lot younger than me. Uh, but he was able to say, as King David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want dot, dot, dot. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Not just some, all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Um, and his point was this. May we all be able to say that his faithfulness gives us hope for the present and for all the chapters to come. Amen. Amen. I was about to say amen then is. Amen. <laughs> so much. Um, I'll tell you the one that I wrote down, yeah. which I'll go to first. My uh, grandparents, my nan died. They had a holiday booked in Spain. And after my nan died, my granddad said, I still want to go to Spain. This was to be our very last holiday before moving nearer to family. But I really want to go. And we said, look, you, I know you, you fought in Burma and you, you've been in the war, but you you can't go on your own. This is not what you think is going to be on your own. So in the end, um, we prayed if if Joe could get a new job, which she was just in the process of changing. If that fell perfectly, then we could actually go away. Me myself and Joe, because I was working agency driving, so I didn't have a job as such, uh, and it did. So we took him away to Spain, and it was wonderful. And the real benefit was. My nan and granddad used to go to the Costa del Sol, you know, the sunny coast where all the British go and you can buy the sun and the Daily Mail on the beachfront. And it was just for Joe and I, not the most relaxing of holidays, but that's all he did. He went to the to the to hotel. They went for a walk on the promenade and that was it for two weeks because Joe and I were there after two days lying in the sun thinking, "We can you is, is boredom can it kill you because it re really starting to lose the plot trying to do what he would normally do so we hired a car and off into the mountains we explored some of the areas where they didn't speak english at all it was wonderful and he said i'd have never had this chance if you hadn't brought me mm -hmm. because he got to explore some of the spain that was not very good commercialized mm -hmm. um, and we got a holiday out of it which we couldn't afford on joe's in between jobs and so our, you know, it wasn't a massive sacrifice at that level. Uh, we had passports. He paid for everything because it was already paid for. It was just one more ticket. But he really wanted to go because he didn't want his wife's, was it 40 or 50 years? He didn't want it, that death to define this last holiday. So we were able to take him because he wanted to live, which I loved. Very good. Very good. Yes. And nice. And as I say, you know, you have to be, I think as Christians, particularly we're called to be flexible. What is God saying 
at this moment in our lives. And yeah. I mean, you know, we need to be flexible enough to say, okay, God, this was my plan, but actually yours is different. And I'm go also, with it. Yeah. I'm also reminded, partly because he fought in Burma as was, um, I think he lost, is it four of his brothers? So when my nan died, he had this real, for me at the time, it was quite a shock. Yeah, well, she's dead. She's gone. And it took me a while to realize he wasn't being cold and callous. Actually, he's being quite true. She is now dead. She has gone. Um, but he was able to just get on with life. He still mourned. You know, he was a, what was it, bordering on a sniper in the war. He was a tough guy. He used to box for his regiment. And he was weeping away for the loss of his wife for so many years. But at the same time, I'm going to carry on living. And he did. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Great story. Yeah, it just it struck me about the, you know, what should I do? And yeah. Anyway, let's come back to who am I? Uh, the Goldilocks bit as well, especially because I use that phrase occasionally. But how often in life do we go through thinking, well, I will do this when, or I will do this if. Um, if I get a better job, then I can start to do this. I'll start to slow down when I get enough money in the bank in a savings account. And I remember a very big, I'm not going to mention the name, a very big chain of national stores in the UK. All the people have been advised to put their money in for pensions. This thing went completely bust. The government said, not our problem, sorry. We know we advise you to do it, but no, you're on your own. So all these people at retirement then had to go and get jobs because they'd literally lost 30, £100,000 that was coming to them was gone. How do they then define their lives? Is it in the savings account that they literally lost? Or do they just get on with life as it presented them? Yeah, very good. Yes, yes. And and, and the Bible says, doesn't it, if you put your tr trust in, in wealth, in riches, it can it can mean you know, a moth moths and rust can can yeah. destroy all the government or disaster. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's what we and who we put our trust in. Who we put our trust in is the key, isn't it? Yeah, mm. and I was thinking about who am I because I've been struggling recently a little bit um, with not so much who am I, but what am I? What am I doing? Because pure has happened. It's been very busy. Everything's kind of changed as we've hit a year. I'm starting to reflect, and I'm thinking, well, what am I now? Because I'm not what I used to be, and what I am is really kind of interesting, but what am i so i actually gone for the last couple of weeks thinking not not it's not a depression thing it's more of a i'm not quite sure what yes. i am right now so i've had to go back and think well actually i know what was missing what was missing was not that i pushed god away but i wasn't keeping as a foundation in my life and now i do a prayer walk every day to a particular gate and i go and have a prayer time and all of a sudden where my life was looking quite flat and deflated and empty it was fine actually but the only thing that's changed is i've got back my focus on jesus it's very good yeah, yeah. And one of the things I, I I do a talk on is how you can get um, complacent in whatever area of life you are. You might think, oh, I'm doing lots of witnessing for the Lord. I'm doing this. I'm running a radio station, in your case. And it becomes the new normal. Yeah. And actually, um, if we're not careful, we can shut down our antennae and think, oh, I'm, I'm doing a good job. You know, compare myself with other people. And suddenly you get flat and then the Holy Spirit is, is you know, it just becomes less important in life. And it's disastrous. And we have to be continually open to the Lord, which is great to hear about you doing your prayer walk, saying, Lord, OK, Lord, this is this is where I am. But what have you got? What's new? You know, you're always doing new things. What's new? Yeah. You know, and please let me be prepared to leave my comfort zone and, you know, embrace change, embrace risk, um, uh, because otherwise I guess get you know comfortable, complacent, same old, same old. And uh, yeah, it can all go very flat. Um, I am going to come on the bit you thought I was going to come back at you as. Uh, who am I connecting with at this stage of my life? Because I remember moving from one church to another church and thinking we're all going to stay friends because we all love God. We're all gone through this stuff together. So when we moved away, we're all going to stay connected. And then you look at your contact list a year later and think, I haven't heard or seen any of them for a year. And you start to realize as you mature through life that there are seasons, there really are seasons of friendships. And there are people who have been really a massive part of our life. And then we've just gone different ways. And it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, but what's great, I'm hoping and praying, and I think this is correct, is that in heaven, when we don't have stresses and trade all the stuff on earth, it's just going to be a massive, massive party with loads of people that we have connected with over the years. And um, it's, it just isn't possible on earth. Um, but it will be possible again one day. So, yeah, I think there are seasons and, uh, you know, we have to be prepared to let some stuff go. Um, bear in mind that God will bring new people as he's brought me and yeah. you, you know, into each other's lives. I didn't know you a year ago. Funnily enough, Andy, I'm going to tell you this on air. We are, I was looking back through the back of my file, my pure 247 file. And, you know, the first conversation we had on the telephone, 12th of September, 23. Was it really? A year today. There we are. I'm looking at it right now. And um, oh, fab. 
who isn't that isn't that amazing just within a year and oh my goodness what's happened in your life and in and in pure27's <laughs> life in, in a year but you you know me as a tiny little part of of what you do uh, our first conversation was exactly a year ago but here's the thing if i had every relationship i've ever had and we're still very much in contact with them <clears throat> excuse me i wouldn't have had the capacity to develop this friendship good point and that's mm. the point if we don't let go of some things we can't let you can't grab onto new stuff yeah, yeah yes people. yes not stuff, you know, new things. Indeed, yes. So um, the other one that I really think is where I wanted to finish this conversation on is is what are you doing in your life now? What you know, who who am I? Okay, I'm I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a banker, I'm a truck driver, I'm a doctor, I'm a I'm a I'm a stay at home dad, which I did for fifteen years. You know that that is a big part of what defines who we are. That's that that boxing again, that puts things in the box. What should I do my you know with my life, not just my vocation? Well, as a stay at home dad, that wasn't my end. That wasn't everything. It was a big part of what I did. I had one child, two child, eventually three children to look after, and my days were spent being very tired. Uh, it's the hardest job I have ever done Read. by a mile, and I've done tipper truck driving with gravel, which I think is the most tiring job I could think of. The parenting is much more tiring. If you're a parent right now, just keep going. It gets better. Fine. Um, but I think who am I connecting with is so important because in the last year, just taking pure as an example, we've, we met a year ago, which is great, but people come in our lives. People come out our lives. What are we doing with our lives today? Who are we investing in? It's such an important question because we look at the problems of the world. We think, I mean, just take Gaza, just for one example. We look at the, the terrible stuff going on in Gaza thinking there's nothing I can do about that situation. And you're right. There might be nothing you can do directly about that situation, but you can do about the people next door who can't make dinner that night because they've fallen over and you've seen the ambulance, but you don't want to interfere. So you won't bother. What if you knock on the door? Are you okay? Well, we've got food, but we can't cook. How much good could we do? And I think this is this is one of my passions with a shameless plug of my new book coming out is every single one of us, I absolutely believe this, has got a God-given dream and gift in our hearts. We just need to be willing to do it. But so often, as your wife was doing, I have to go to the, ch the school gate because you've got to get your kids. Well, that's a vocation because while she's there, she can talk to other mums. Because she's a mum, talking to mums, all of a sudden their parents talking together, they're going to listen. Mm. Absolutely. And that's so key. I mean, you as a doctor, you've got a much better chance of talking to your fellow doctor friends and colleagues than I have because, you know, if I came in as a trucker to a doctor, well, we totally different language. You know, my family always laugh when we have a, a tradesman come because I just natter because that's what I used to do because I'm very comfortable with people like that because I used to deliver to them. Yes. Others oh, less so. So there are people in our lives and, you know, who we're investing into. I don't think we have to look really hard. Yeah. And I think I think what I learned from it is don't despise your current situation. Mm. May not be your plan. It may not be in human terms as good as it was in the past. You may not. And none of us know exactly what God's got planned in the future. But now is important. Wh whoever you are, mm. wherever you are, whatever skills you have, whatever losses, whatever dreams now is important. So not to say don't plan for the future. Of course, we know that we have brains, but but now matters. So, yeah, that, I think that was a good lesson for me. Yeah, it, it is that now, though. I mean, I've just been out to Asda uh, to go and get some supermarket food stuff because we haven't got any, you know, so I went to pick up Joe's on a bus. And, you know, there are people there, and I do try and smile and make a point of it. I really do, because I don't know. I'm only going to go through there for 20 seconds. I may never see that cashier again. But if I smile, that's me doing everything I feel I can do in that context when I'm rushing through because we've got no dinner. You know, there are things we can do, but we don't need to look really hard. Who am I going to serve? I'm going to go to Africa or Brazil and I'm going to serve. You know, there are people next door. Yeah. And I'll just I'll just sort of finish with one phrase from my dentist. I've got a Christian friend who's a dentist. And he, you know, several times people have said to him, you're different. What is it about you? And, and because of the way he interacted with people in the now, he had a chance to share faith. Um, and I just think, you know, obviously that's really important, but we need to interact with people now, the people that God puts into our lives now um you know they're there for a reason and we're there for a reason so let's let's just yeah let's not just think ahead or behind concentrate on now i'm um, i've just been i'm oh, three quarters of the way through reading about project pill which was a uh project by open doors international organization to take a million bibles by boat into mainland china i've been reading that book i've just got past the part where they've met some of the chinese people um on the chinese beach and what struck me is the joy that these people have, despite what can only be described as 
it, it, unimaginably difficult, painful, ter- terribly bad stuff going on. But we love Jesus. We're so grateful you've come. We'll give our life if we can give a Bible to someone and it gives them Jesus Christ. And what strikes me every time I hear about the Chinese people talking as Christians, you know, it, they don't care about the situation because the situation they're in is where God's put them. So if God's put me here, I'm going to do what I can right now with the people that I can invest in right now that God has put my way right now, whether that's prison guards beating them or people in the, you know, other criminals in in, in the cell. This is where I am. This is my calling right now. I love that. So there's there's our message for all, all our listeners. I think is you know, maybe just a little bit of self examination. You know, what is your situation? You know, what is God doing now, and what could God do now? Let's use our imagination, sort of healthily and holily, um, holily, you. sort of words that holily. <laughs> use, let's let's have a holy aspect to our imagination, um, and yeah, okay, God, um, yeah, here I am. Thank you very much. Use me. Amen. We'll stop there. If you've got any questions for Dr. Scott, if you've seen a hot topic in the news you want him to cover for you, or you've got an ache and a pain you want to ask him a question about, you can do. Just get in touch. Email us here. Hello at pure247radio.org. Hello at pure247radio.org. Dr. Richard Scott, GP as ever, one year on from when we first spoke. Thank you. Uh, Our anniversary. (laughs) Our anniversary. Rated five stars by Sorted Magazine's film critic, Pure 247 takes you behind the scenes of the birth of a global Christian radio station. Andy B will have you laughing and crying as you discover what it takes to create ministry that matters in this inspiring tale of perseverance, honesty and vulnerability. Buckle up and get ready for a story that's uplifting as it is entertaining. Behind the microphone, they face bankruptcy, eviction, and two life-changing surgeries. Can they make it? Will they make it? Get your copy of this life-changing book today. Pure 247 is available now on Amazon. Andy B is best described as a man after God's own heart, who insists that God's vision and resourcing from all handicaps.